Hi everyone, my name is uh, Salman Moller, and before I begin my uh, talk, I would like to acknowledge the people I've worked with on this project, uh, my advisors Larry Abbott and Nate Sattel, and my colleague Abi Zadina. So to provide you with a framework for the talk, learning in biological neural circuits is distributed across many synapses and layers in multi-layer networks. But how learning in different layers of the network shape the output of the network is poorly understood, and in this talk, I'll discuss a specific computational problem associated with learning in a middle layer of a network and show you how the brain has evolved to solve the problem. So the system we study is an electric fish, which across its body has electroreceptors allowing the fish to sense um, electric field generated by external stimuli, including its prey. Also in the tail, the fish has an electric organ which emits an electric organ discharge, an EOD, and this EOD pulse generates a strong electric field around the fish. Though this, electric, this strong electric field uh, is useful for some purposes for the fish, here it would mask this small electric field generated by, uh, by its prey. And past work, past work have shown that the fish learns to predict and to subtract the self-generated EOD sensory input so that external input like the prey can be efficiently detected. And all I'll tell you in this talk is what we have learned from data. <coughs> so now I'll walk you through the uh, brain structure that does this subtraction. Initially, in the command nucleus, in the brainstem, the fish generates a command that is sent to the electric organ in the tail that makes the EOD, that generates the EOD. The EOD pulse then generates an EOD sensory response in the electroreceptors visualized over here. And then that information is being sent through electrosensory afferents to the output cells of the electrosensory lobe, the ELL. As well, as the fish generates the EOD command, it also sends another signal called the corollary discharge signals to granule cells. And these granule cells synapse onto the output cells and these synapses are plastic. So the fish receives this self-generated EOD sensor input as well as an externally generated like a prey signal input. And, 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 and past studies have shown that the role of the ELL is to subtract the self-generated uh, input so that the output now can encode the externally generated input. And beautiful work over the last few decades has shown that an anti-heavy and SDDP learning in the granule cell synapses drive the granule cell's input to predict the self-generated input and make over time, I'll start it with a flat line, you will see over time, it learns to make an inverted copy of the self-generated input so it can provide the correct cancellation signal. But the problem is that 90% of granule cell synapses in the ELL are made into this group of inhibitory interneurons called medium ganglion cells or MG cells, which also receive electrosensory input. So effectively, the signal that the granule cells learn to make is an inverted copy of the, uh, of the EOD, the self-generated EOD sensory input that in this case inhibits these MG cells. And in this talk, I'm not going to tell you about uh, um, why these MG cells exist in the ELL, but rather how and what signal do they provide to the system. So now notice that if the learned signal over here made by the granule cells would be transmitted to the output cells, they would provide the proper cancellation signal of the self-generated EOD sensory input because these neurons are inhibitory. But here there is a paradox. And the paradox is that if cancellations happen in the middle layer, in the MG cells, it means that after learning, they have no signal to give to the output cells because they are canceled. And, the, and, 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 I'm sorry, and the output cells, because they need a learned cancellation signal to cancel their self-generated EOD sensory input. And this is a, a paradox of learning in a middle layer because here learning basically eliminated transmitting a signal from the MG cells. So a hint to the resolution of this paradox is in the fact that MG cells generate two types of spikes. Dendritic spikes called over here broad spikes for their shapes and axonal spikes called narrow spikes. The broad spikes 
um, baseline firing rate is about one hertz, and they drive plasticity in the synapses from the granule cells. Narrow spikes do not drive plasticity. Their baseline rate, though, is about 50 hertz, which means that they are the signal that communicates information from the MG cells to the output cells. Now, past studies have focused on broad spikes, and like I showed you before, anti-heavy and STDP learning will drive a broad spike rate to be unmodulated, basically to be flat, so there's no information here to transmit to the output cells. And if narrow spikes also would be unmodulated, there's nothing to transmit to the output cells. So what we have found, and what we can show from data, is that narrow spike response is indeed modulated. And before I show you the data, let me tell you how it happens. We found that these MG cells are compartmentalized such that the electrosensory input that MG cell receive is only locally inhibiting the broad spikes that are generated at the dendrites. So this local inhibition is not shared with the narrow spikes. Then the broad spikes drive plasticity and the granule cells learn to make an inverted copy of the self-generated sensory input to the broad spikes. And that learned signal then is propagated and shared with the narrow spikes. So effectively, the narrow spikes now carry just the learned signal while omitting this teaching signal, this self-generated EOD sensory input. And what that predicts, that if we look at the narrow spike response at equilibrium, they should match the granule cell input to the broad spikes, which we can experimentally isolate. And indeed, they match, as you see over here in the data. These are the broad spikes granule cell input. These are narrow spikes at equilibrium. And furthermore, if the uh, narrow spike response at equilibrium matches the self-generated EOD sensory input to the output cells, it means that it can provide a proper cancellation signal to the output cells because it inhibits the output cells. And here's the data. Indeed, these two signals are matching. So through the narrow spikes, these are signals. So to summarize uh, the point I made until now, we found that learning and communication in MG cells is compartmentalized such that learning is driven by the broad spike response that in this case encodes the error. So broad spikes encode the error. In our case, the error is the difference between the granule cell input and the electrosensory input. At equilibrium, the error goes to zero, so there is no information in the broad spikes. But narrow spikes, they communicate just the learned signal, in this case, the granule cell signal to the output cells. And finally, I'll tell you that what we found about the role of MG cells in the ELL makes a very strong prediction about the connectivity of the ELL, which we are able to test. So for simplicity, I only showed you half of the ELL with these groups of cells. But in fact, just like on and off cells in the retina, the ELL also contains a group of output cells that are being inhibited by electrosensory input. And we have found that there is another group of MG cells that through a very similar mechanism to what I've shown you before, provide a proper cancellation signal to these output I cells, as you can see over here in the data. But however, throughout this talk, I presented to you as if we know what group of MG cells is connected to which group of output cells. In fact, this has not been known before. Uh, rather, this has been a, a do or die prediction for us about the connectivity between MG and output cells. And we are fortunate that we, can, we could test this because these two types of cells, the output E and output I cells, their somas reside on separate layers of the ELL. So what we did to test this, we recorded from MG cells in vivo to find what signal they make, and then we injected them with dye and then morphologically reconstructed them and found that the axons of these two groups of MG cells, shown over here in red, I hope you can see it, do reside on two separate layers as well. And in fact, they reside on the same layer of output cells to which they provide the cancellation signal as we predicted. So to conclude in this talk, I hope I conveyed that compartmentalization of function within individual neurons is necessary for learning in multi-layer network in the electric fish. But we think that our work may be useful for understanding learning in multi-layer networks in other brain regions, such as the neocortex and hippocampus. And we see a number of intriguing parallels between mechanisms we found in the ELL and models proposed for multi-layer learning, just like the one we heard in the previous talk. And I look forward to discussing uh, these ideas further with you throughout this conference. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. So people should not feel intimidated by going in front. Oh, okay, we have a question. Great. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit to how you think the different types of spikes, like, so the broad spikes seem to be the only ones that undergo plasticity, the or the, to, in, to induce plasticity right. in the hair, and then the shape of the narrow spikes is imposed by the weight change. Do you think it has something to do with, like, the actual duration of the spike, opening different like calcium channels, do they do kind of the standard, yeah, standard the NMDAR stuff? In this case, because it's, um, the plasticity is from granule cells input, only mm -hmm. the broad spikes propagate actually up the dendrites oh, to the that. granule cells, yeah. and that's the reason they drive plasticity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.